applied on Oakland Community College. With an OCC education, the possibilities are virtually unlimited. Enroll today. Here's Guy Gordon. Good afternoon, everybody. Happy Wednesday to you. Welcome in. We invite you to tune in on uh, Facebook, on our Facebook Live at uh, our WJR Facebook page, because uh, as we said, we will be spotlighting Oakland Community College all day today. And we talk a lot about what's going to keep Michigan strong, what is going to help us bounce back from the economic um, calamities that we're seeing in some sectors of the economy. It's going to be about skills. It's going to be about the opportunities that we build into ourselves and investing in ourselves to make the most of those opportunities when they present themselves. And that's why we're focusing on this very important piece of the education puzzle, and that is community colleges, specifically OCC, Oakland Community College. We're joined by the Chancellor, Peter Provenzano, and uh, it's good to have you with us, Peter. Welcome. Guy, it's a pleasure to be here. So I got to tell you, you know, I I was already planning on talking with you today, and I look up and I get an alert from the Detroit News with this headline, racked by COVID losses, Michigan colleges make unprecedented cuts. Obviously, it's been a tough year. Just give me a status report on what's been happening at OCC. As you know, it's been a very tough year, but I have to say from OCC's perspective, we've been uh, very fortunate. Early on, we focused uh, back in March um, on converting all of our classes from face to face to a remote format, we did. We did that. We we transferred over fifteen hundred classes to a remote format in uh, in a little over a week and a half. And so it was a Herculean task, but we have an awesome team. Uh, we we pulled through and we successfully did that and transferred all of our student services to online. So the result is is that ever since March, we've been operating uh, remotely, uh, including all of our student services having students meet on a very limited basis face-to-face for some of the skilled trades training that's very difficult to do remotely. But the result is because we've been able to keep classes going, we've been able to keep the revenue streams flowing and people employed. And, uh, and so we've, uh, uh, we've been able to uh, uh, withstand uh, some of the, the budget cuts that other universities and colleges are facing. We know that as horrible as the COVID-19 experience has been, that but for every calamity, there's also, in some cases, an opportunity. And I was looking at this at the outset and thinking, geez, we've got people in lowered skilled jobs getting hit hard. But they are getting unemployment checks that are $600 a week bigger than they're normally getting. So they're, in some cases, they have money in their pocket and also time on their hands because they've been furloughed. And I thought, what a perfect opportunity. I would think that OCC and other community colleges would be really seeing a boost in enrollment because of this as people look at this opportunity and say, hey, I can upskill. I can, as as you say, empower myself. Has that been the reality for OCC and other community colleges? You know, what's interesting is that it really took us by surprise. We thought the very same thing. But um, what we found is because of the tremendous disruption of COVID and the pandemic, um, while we're seeing a, a decrease or a decline in enrollment, uh, from what I refer to as our traditional student, that part-time student, because they're just trying to manage so much. Um, you know, working from home, uh, mm-hmm. oftentimes they're, they're a teacher at home, right? So they, they have students that are taking online classes, so it's just a lot to juggle. Um, we also see a lot of students, university students, that are coming to community colleges because they're being displaced. And so right. uh, <laughs> what we know is that this does not look at all like we had thought. Uh, but to your point, there's never been a better time to invest in yourself and take advantage of the flexibility of these courses being fully remote. You can take them 24-7, uh, as well as there's so much money out there uh, that students can take advantage of to continue on with their, their acad- academic journey. That's a really important point. What is the financial assistance available for those that want to take the plunge and start investing in themselves? There's so much. So speaking from OCC's perspective, we have over 300 academic scholarships that are available. We have you know, Chancellor Scholarship, which is just a tremendous scholarship. We each year we offer 100 qualifying students uh, about $3,500 a year, which covers the tuition and fees for their first year. But we also have, uh, we just did it this past summer, and we plan on continuing it again uh, this next summer, uh, a scholarship that we refer to as the Summer Momentum Scholarship. And what that does is it, it provides students who took classes in the fall as well as the winter up to six credit hours. So it's basically two free classes. Uh, to encourage them to come back to school to keep on with their academic journey this summer. And then we have a student success fund that helps, uh, that's really designed by very generous donors uh, from across Oakland County, as well as internally here at OCC. And we use that money to help students who are facing hardships 
that really go beyond education. And then one of the things that we you know hear a lot about right now is the Futures for Frontliners program, which is being offered by the state of Michigan, which is a phenomenal program yeah. that our frontline workers can take advantage of. So as we look at this and as people consider, you know, what do I want to do if, if this is presented to me as an opportunity? What are the, the one things I think is great about community colleges, and I don't want to step on my four-year academic learning institutions here and step on their toes, but you are, there, there is a value proposition there that is quite unique and quite compelling. So if, I, if I'm sitting here as a student or as an 18-year-old that took a gap semester, I'm trying to figure out what to do. Give me the best value proposition in terms of saying, these are the fields of studies you need to look at right now where you can see immediate benefit upon concluding this program. What, what we always talk about is, you know, pre, yeah, pre-pandemic, there was a very, very tight labor market. Post-pandemic, I see that labor market even being tighter. Um, there are, every company that we talk to, corporations, they're saying, they're hiring now and they will be hiring in full force post pandemic. And we know that if you have a credential, some sort of training, it increases your employability as well as the amount of money that you can earn in your lifetime. There's a huge demand in nursing, all of the skill traits. We hear that, you know, on a daily basis, um, robotics, uh, manufacturing, and then let's not forget about public services, police, fire, EMS. Right. You'll hear later on from Dave Cece talking a little about that. Uh, and then the other thing is workforce development. There's a tremendous amount of, uh, of need. You know, so corporations are always looking for new talent. Uh, and what they're finding is that with that tight talent pool, their talent is right there uh, working within their, their, their corporation. So mm-hmm. it's a great opportunity for those companies to send uh, their employees to school or to bring OCC into the company. Uh, we do a lot of customized training there. And so th- there's almost, the possibilities are endless. There's a huge demand across the board for all of these industries. Well, and Peter, you know, you're, you're preaching to the choir here because everybody wants to talk about, well, we need to raise the minimum wage. You want to raise your wage, raise your skill level. That is currency in the marketplace that nobody can take away from you and no government can mandate. Your skills are what's going to make you marketable from here on out. So thank you so much uh, for bringing us into the college tour and keep uh, putting us on your on your list. And uh, we look forward to uh, some discussions here throughout the day with, with uh, some of your uh, uh, department leaders. Pleasure, Guy. Take care. You too. Uh, let's get to Michael Stett's WGR Traffic first. When we come back, there's finally momentum on Capitol Hill, or what appears to be that. I don't want to get ahead of myself when it comes to COVID relief. We're going to talk with Congresswoman Alyssa Slotkin next on The Guy Gordon Show. Hey, Michael, love the decorations. Hey, what's happening, Guy? It's all good. I I, I feel very underdressed now with what you're doing there. <laughs> well, you could thank my wife. Uh, my I will. Wife. What's yeah. happening with traffic? <laughs> We have in the, in the city, two lanes blocked on 96 eastbound right now due to a vehicle fire. Traffic getting by in the right lane only. Expect delays there. And in Oakland County, road construction has the left lane closed on 696 eastbound right now between the Southfield Road and Coolidge. That's scheduled that construction through 3 p.m. on Friday. Now, WJR Weather First from the Weather Channel, sponsored by North Bloomfield Properties. If you're looking for a place to call home, let North Bloomfield Properties find the best place for you and your family. They also provide pre screen quality tenants to their property owners. They love to match good people to good homes. Contact them today, northbloomfield.com. Good 10 degrees, warmer than average today, and uh, looks like some rain headed our way finally into the weekend forecast coming up for Saturday. Almost an inch of rain coming up uh, for Detroit. We're in the mid-40s this afternoon, but 10 degrees warmer than average. 29 tonight, tomorrow partly cloudy, 42. I'm meteorologist Scott Laurie. More on News Talk 760 WJR. All right. Um, are we going to be checking out with the other guys before we get on there to make sure that they've got uh, their speakers in the right spot? What? We are, are we going to make a call to the other people that he's got so that we can make I – mean, I don't know how we check them out early. I mean, I I guess what we do is we just pop them up on screen before before they come on. Okay. Well, hey, Mark Mark's found us after all this time. Yeah, guy, I don't think that that was anything that we are going to be able to fix. Yeah, I don't know. Um, because I've had the same problem on occasion, where sometimes the built-in mic or excuse me the built-in speakers will mute themselves because your mic is on and that's why you need a headset yeah yeah and i mean at that point he doesn't have one this is the first time we've personally encountered that so i the only option at that point was probably to 
have him on the phone. Okay. Well, we got it on, and that's the important yeah. thing. But yep. yeah, and he he was quick. He was quick with it. All right. Actually, and we're coming back here. It's a short break. So we have Congresswoman Alyssa Slock in here. Oh. Uh, so what do we do here on StreamYard while we're listening to Alyssa Slotkin? Uh, a little radio magic. A little radio magic. Um, are you playing it down the line here for those watching on StreamYard? That's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, I got it. Let's see here. Well, I guess what I'm wondering is, do I need to cons uh, continue chatting here? No, um, I I'll, I'll play it down the line. Okay. So, here we come. December 9th. Slotkin. All right. All right. We're going away here. Bringing in Slotkin. Okay. In the meantime, should I mute my mic or are you going to do it? Something. This is the Guy Gordon Show on News Talk 760 WJR. Well, it is busy times on Capitol Hill, that's for sure, as they try to hammer out some kind of a COVID relief bill before they have to leave for the Christmas holiday. It's not proving to be easy, but then nothing ever is. And uh, I thought it was a good opportunity to invite on one of the authors of the bipartisan problem solvers proposal that has been getting traction and kind of acted as the Kickstarter to this. Eighth District Congresswoman Alyssa Slotkin joining us on this uh, Wednesday afternoon. How are you? I'm well. Thanks for having me. Busy times and interesting times. When you see Josh Hawley on the right and Rashida Tlaib on the left, both agreeing on something, and that is that Americans should have direct payments from Uncle Sam, you know you're living in interesting times. Tell me <laughs> where tell me where the COVID relief package stands right now after you've discussed it with your leadership and after the White House made its pitch for a $600 uh, direct stimulus payment. Yeah. Well, you know, we, uh, this Problem Solvers Caucus, equal numbers of Democrats and Republicans came up with our proposal. Um, it's just under a trillion dollars, $908 billion, um, and it is the basis of negotiations. Those negotiations are happening both in the House and the Senate and are happening in real time. Um, we've been getting kind of um, updates every few hours on those negotiations. The White House has, um, has frankly signaled support for that, that, that number, right? $908 billion. They're okay mm -hmm. with it. But of course, um, they have a different take on what should be in the bill. And um, their proposal today, which um, you know the president indicated he wants to send every American who makes under a certain amount of money six hundred dollars, you know, another sort of lesser amount of stimulus payment. He wants to do that, but in in response, he wants to cut additional unemployment insurance. So you know that's you know controversial, and um, I think that's some of the stuff that we're debating here. But we know. Um, at least from our group, that we cannot go home for Christmas without some sort of a deal. And it's never going to be perfect. That's the nature of compromise. Um, and I've been kind of screaming my head off here that the, the sort of desperation I feel from my business owners and the folks in the, the healthcare industry, yes. um, I'm not feeling that same desperation from everyone here in D.C. So I'm trying to bring some of that anger and frustration, uh, frankly, to the floor of the House. How is it that they could be that disconnected? Aren't they experiencing the same things that we are? You know, I really don't know. I, I'm still kind of new to being an elected official. And the thing that, that surprises me most is like, I'm hearing from people constantly. I'm getting texts from business owners in Rochester. I'm getting calls, like hundreds and hundreds of calls into my office. I'm getting emails. Like, I can't go grocery shopping without someone bringing up the need for some sort of relief. So it is hard for me to understand how some people don't feel that same urgency. Either they're not answering those calls or they're just not out in public. I don't know what it is, but uh, those of us who are, are feeling it big time. Okay. Um, when you look at this, we I saw a letter come out from the uh, Greater Detroit Regional Chamber of Commerce. Uh, yeah. today, Sandy Brewer, yep. I, I know you got the letter. Uh, every congressperson from Michigan did yep. saying, look, not not only do we need liability protection for businesses, but we also need aids to cities and states because they are essential yep. in this as well. Yet when I look to Washington, they seem to form that as an either or equation. Shouldn't yeah. both sides just give up on those things, give the other side what they want and move on? Because bottom line is it's needed. Or can we not Absolutely. stay under the $1 trillion cap if we do that? 
No, no, we absolutely can. And our deal, this bipartisan deal that we put out into the world includes um, uh, quite a bit of money from the federal government for state and local governments um, only on lost revenue due to COVID. So, and I'm willing, absolutely willing to talk about some protections, liability protections for businesses. I understand their desire to have those. So I'm, I'm ready to cut a deal today. Um, what we've seen is, uh, frankly, the Senate does not support money for state and local governments. They just don't. And what we're going to see in mid-2021, if we don't have money in the bank, is you're going to see layoffs of fire, police, first responders, public health yeah. officials, teachers. So um, we're, that's a, a kind of the big sticking point remaining um, in negotiations. And, uh, you know, I want, uh, I, I would never want money from the federal government to go to states in normal times, but we're not in normal times. No, and for those that say they don't want to defund the police, should certainly pay attention to what the consequences will be if we don't give some assistance. And as you said, as, as I understand it, your bill does narrowly tailor this so that it will only be demonstrable COVID-related expenses that they would get compensated for, not for years and years, for instance, of maybe pension uh, irregularities or pension irresponsibilities. 100%. You have to prove Literally, by opening your books, you'd have to prove that the money you're missing is due to lost revenue specifically tied to COVID. No unsolvent pensions, no previous debts, nothing because you mismanaged your local budget, but purely yeah. something you can prove. And I believe in that. I, that's important to me, too, as a fiscally responsible person. I, I want to just pivot for a moment to what's going on at the Pentagon. Uh, President Biden making it official. General Lloyd Austin is his pick for Secretary of Defense. I understand that on the Democratic side, there's some growing opposition there for a variety of reasons. Republicans have different reasons for being uh, having some concerns. This would be the second general in a row to take what is normally a civilian post. Obviously, he has a, a, a fairly solid record, but is he the right man for the job in this time coming on the heels of General Mattis? Yeah, so General Austin is wonderful and obviously a historic pick. I, I worked with him many, many years, uh, starting when he was commanding general in Iraq. So he has he has a wonderful resume. I, I think what we have here is an issue of sort of principle. And since 1947, you know, when we had this rule that you couldn't go kind of right from being um, in active duty, uniform service, to being the Secretary of Defense, because our founding fathers wanted a civilian um, to be in control of the military. So um, it does require a second waiver, and that's controversial because if you do two waivers in a row, you know, th it's an open question about whether you still have a law. I mean, you know, it just kind of becomes commonplace. And I'm a big believer in civilian control of the military. Now, I'm open to talking to General Austin and hearing some commitments, hopefully, that he's willing to make to make sure that he doesn't militarize um, control of the military. Uh, and, you know, I, I believe that he's the capable of doing that. And he just gave a speech on TV indicating he would be willing to have those conversations. So, um, you know, we're going to see here, but uh, no one denies that he's eminently qualified and that he's a historic pick. Yeah, even though I don't know that those should be the top priorities, if, if it means with a break from this very important tradition as as well. Uh, Congressman Melissa Slotkin, it's always a pleasure. So many more things here. Asian carp, I know, got finally passed yesterday. That's yeah. great news for the Great Lakes. <laughs> but we're out of time, as always, and you're a busy person. So we're going to let you go. But thank you so much. If I don't talk to you before then, have a wonderful holiday with your family. You as well. Warm, warm wishes. Yes, thank you very much, and to you and yours. Uh, Congresswoman Melissa Slotkin, uh, if you got some comments on any of those uh, topics or anything else on your mind, we're going to open the phones. 1-800-859-0957. one 859 wjr Should Congress stay in session until they get it done? Or should they leave <laughs> before they do any more damage? Your thoughts next on The Guy Gordon Show. Here's Michael Stetz, WJR Traffic. This report is sponsored by BetterHelp.com. Is there something interfering with your happiness? Visit BetterHelp.com slash feel happy for 15% off your first month. Join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. That's BetterHelp.com slash feel happy. 
in the city on 96 eastbound between Evergreen Road and the south field. You're stop and go right now from Outer Drive due to the earlier vehicle fire. The left shoulder blocked. Expect delays. In Oakland County, road construction has the left lane closed right now on 696 eastbound between Southfield Road and Coolidge. That construction scheduled until 3 p.m. on Friday. And in Wayne County, you're moving slowly right now on 75 southbound between Livernois and Springwell Street. Now WJR Weather First from the Weather Channel. Sponsored by the Cremation Society of Michigan. For over 32 years, the Cremation Society of Michigan has been providing dignified cremation services without the cost of traditional funerals. For cremation information, contact the Cremation Society of Michigan at 1-800-241-3131 or visit cremationmichigan.com. Partly cloudy heading into this evening with a low of 28 tonight. Cloudy again for Thursday with a high tomorrow of 41. Right now it's 39 degrees. I'm Michael Stetz, WJR News, three minutes. All right. So am I coming through? There we go. Uh, let's see here. Mark always seems to find us. So does my mom. Hi, mom. <laughs> uh, we have someone here suggesting that guy's on from 12 to 5. Uh, I, we might have. Come on, I know I, you guys are up for that. I may have to Come talk on, to my to agent five? about that. That wouldn't be a doubling of your workload. That would be a an yeah. octopling yeah. of your well, workload, I mean, right? I'm sitting here. And, and then there's Tom, who thinks yeah. we suck. Uh, Tom, uh, this is what it is, and supporting local institutions of learning is not necessarily a bad thing, and I don't think that uh, stimulus is necessarily a sucky well, I was, topic. I was going to ignore that guy. Opinion, I figured I whatever we're talking about, he'd say we suck. Oh, no, yeah, we, we take on all He's comers. probably not even really listening. Comment. He probably just saw us. He probably just saw that we were on. And... Well, I'll tell you what. He did He did send out the, the thing about Cynthia Johnson, who was one of the lawmakers uh, at the Giuliani – uh, thing the other day and uh, who's trying who I actually supported her trying to get Giuliani to be put under oath it's stupid not to put a witness under oath if you're investigating something uh, but and the same thing that went with the elections officials yesterday who were put under oath but Cynthia Johnson what she said on her Facebook page about those of you that are soldiers uh, you know you all know what to do in terms of defending her from the threats there's no excuse for the threat she's getting about being lynched and all those things it's absolutely flat out wrong but then for her to say <laughs> to call out to her military buddies to do something about it is outrageous as well and the gop has stripped her of all of her committee assignments so it's gonna be interesting to see what uh <coughs> what comes out there I, I remember when politics was boring once upon a time yeah, yeah. or maybe well you know it, pro it probably never was boring i've just been you know paying attention yep recently so anyway, we welcome everybody in. Uh, if you don't want to just comment on Facebook, we welcome your calls at 1-800-859-0957. We're looking forward to uh, speaking about engineering education coming up in this half hour. There, there is no skill set that delivers a bigger bang for the buck than engineering right now. And if you talk to folks that are in the automotive sector, they haven't slowed down a bit. In fact, great article today from Ally Financial that says that they're going to have a problem uh, they think they can finance a lot of car sales, but there aren't enough cars and trucks out there to sell. Hey, guy, I got a question for you. Since we're doing this behind the scenes stuff, during the uh, Slotkin tape, you were moving your mouth, and we were trying to figure out if you were trying to mouth along with it to make it look live or if you yes, were like. Yes, that's prepping. exactly what I was doing. <laughs> You're I, being was really throw, I was trying to throw Michael off and to see if I could. Uh, if I could fake him out. Well, I'm like, is guy talking over the interview on the on the stream yard? I'm going to tell him to, to stop. No, I was trying to remember my exact toss to Michael so that I could mimic that and uh, and maybe oh, make God. him laugh. Yeah, that's the one. See, that, that's 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 the advantage of watching behind the scenes. You get that type of stuff. You know, everyone on the radio thinks it's live, but but our uh, our uh, Facebook uh, our Facebook uh, insiders. Hi, Aunt Patty. Um, they know. They know that it's on a tape. Hey, Mike, I'm going to make an executive decision here, and let's check in with Jolene Chapman because she's already here. <clears throat> and we can make sure she. Oh, what can a great idea! Her. I can hear her. Hi, Jolene. Can you uh -huh. hear me? 
Hi, I sure can. How are you? Hey. Right. <laughs> Good. Sounds great. Yeah, we, we had some issues earlier, so as soon as we see you pop up, we, we check your uh, we check your uh, audio. Great. And if anybody sneaks up behind you in that window, we'll let you know. Okay? Yeah, thanks. I appreciate that. Yeah. Isn't, isn't it Ellen that always has somebody showing up in the window outside of her? Yes, uh, Andy, I would hate yeah. That. Andy, yeah. What is the story behind that? Because there's been times when Ellen's been on the screen here, but we obviously have it muted during the show. And all I see is her just freak out, and I have no idea what's happening. Well, I hear she's not nice to her staff, so she probably makes them all um, you know, watch from outside the, uh, the window. I also don't know the latest with that. Yeah, I haven't seen. Obviously, I, I, I will occasionally put her on, but usually I've got a, a, a cable news on for breaking news here. But yeah, I. Can... I... Go so ahead, tell guys. me, while well, I've got you here, Jolene, in terms of um, admissions, how is the engineering program doing? So. You know, it's been a struggle for us because we're limited um, in our the number of people we can have in the lab at one time due to equipment and that sort of thing. And then when we had to switch and we had the uh, social distancing measures that were put in place, we had to decrease the capacity in some cases by half. So uh, we have students who want to get in, but they just can't because we just have uh, we don't have enough enough room enough sections so it's been a bit of a struggle but we're doing the best we can well good enough i it's and i wondered if infrastructure wasn't going to be a problem in a lot of cases because of just the, the physical plant not being big enough we've, we've seen that in so many different things where they could boost production but because of the distancing you can't do as much with your line in, in manufacturing and so right yeah same yeah so um, in terms of if goals, if there's anything that you want me to hit hard, I can ask you about that first. So just let me know what you before we have to uh, continue on with taking calls here. We've got about a seven minute call segment. Okay. Um, let, let me know what you want to accomplish real quickly, and I'll I'll make sure we get to that. Yeah, I, uh, I'll i just list, I have eight programs that fall under engineering, manufacturing, and industrial technologies, and I'll just list those and uh, talk a little bit about um, and I'll lead you to apprenticeships after that and the opportunities for real hands-on. Yes, yes, that would be great. Yeah, I, I'm ready to talk about that. I want to talk about how uh, the programs that we have are preparing those essential workers who uh, were really the heroes during this, This have been the heroes during this pandemic. And they've always been essential, but this has really brought it forward. Well, and I also want to talk about the idea of future for frontliners, because we're, we're having people that are already proven in the workforce, right? They've shown yeah. that they've got the soft skills. They can get up in time. They show up, show up for the job. They're, they're already go-getters, and, and it's giving them the skills to really back take, in take here, off in guy. terms of social mobility and to make a bigger income. And that's and I, right. I think those are good things we can right. chat about. Well, we'll look forward to it in a little bit. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. I'll bring you right back in here, Jolene. I was going to take you out while we get. Welcome back to a special edition of the Guy Gordon Show on WJR. For a spotlight on Oakland Community College, with an OCC education, the possibilities are virtually unlimited. Enroll today. Here's Guy. So I want to know what's on your mind. 1-800-859-0957. 1-800-859-0WJR. You heard from Alyssa Slotkin, who is a member of this Problem Solvers group, which tries uh, as best they can to work in a bipartisan way. And they usually can to try to kickstart some of these uh, COVID stimulus packages. I told you that Sandy Barua, our good friend from the uh, Regional Chamber of Commerce, sent a letter saying, you know what? this idea of, well, we can't have COVID liability protections, but we do need to send as much money as we can to state and cities. They need to find middle ground and lay down their arms. Quit quibbling over that. Give a little to each other because we need both. And I loved what she was saying about the idea that that this has to be demonstrable in the books. You don't get any compensation. You're not going to get anything from Uncle Sam in terms of revenue sharing unless you can prove that's a COVID-related expense. And now I would say make sure you got somebody in the inspector general's office handy to make sure that they don't abuse that because we know there are plenty of cities that have gotten in way over their head on debt 
and, uh, and pension liabilities and may try to use this as a candy store to clean up some of the, the past misdeeds or past irresponsibilities. one 800 One other thing. This was a comment yesterday on Jake Tapper's show on CNN, and I just want you to process this for me and see if you process it the way I do. Uh, Senator Dick Durbin was on with, with Jake Tapper, and Tapper asked a reasonable question. Look, you're looking at a $900 billion package right now, under $1 trillion. He said, back before the election, President Trump was offering you $1.8 trillion, but your leadership was quibbling trying to get $400 billion more. So... you're coming away with half of what the president was willing to offer. Didn't you kind of blow it? This is what Durbin says. There was some exuberance involved because an election was coming and they were both bidding one another and trying to find some common ground. They didn't reach that point. To return to those pre-election days and sentiments, political sentiments is very difficult. So in other words, it was political sentiments that was driving this. They didn't want to give the president a win ahead of an election. Is he not saying there that they that they delayed on purpose because of the election? They delayed direct support to you, extension of unemployment benefits, more PPE, PPP for struggling businesses, money that could have been used for vaccine distribution or to at least do the initial setup of those plans, all of those things because of political considerations. That's my read of it. What say you? Do you interpret that the same way? He didn't use the word delay, but he certainly implied it. Uh, Let's get to Kip in Canton this afternoon while we await your calls. Kip, good to have you with us. Thank you. Can you hear me? I sure can. A little bit of noise, but give us a little volume and we'll be fine. Uh, Can you put on I'm going through something. You're not going to be able to hear me. Come back real quick. You know, if you've got a question, shoot it at me and I'll try to answer it, okay? and then, and then the, okay if you can't take it off hands free we're going to have to uh give you a chance to call back all right kip give me yeah do me a favor and and, and do that i understand you had a question about the water announcement and i'm not sure that i could answer it but uh it's something worth talking about uh for those of you that haven't heard mayor duggan yesterday said that there will be at least a two-year moratorium on water shutoffs in the city of detroit from a humanitarian standpoint that's a very good thing a very nice thing Um, And he says he has the money to do it through a variety of sources. My problem with it is, is aren't you then setting up yet another expectation about whether or not you're going to be able to get payments? Because we know how far in arrears those payments were for a lot of uh, Detroit residents. Let's travel over to Livonia. Barb calling in with some uh, thoughts on the uh, on the idea of of COVID relief maybe breaking through the logjam. Hi, Barbara. Hi, I just want to say that uh, I thought everybody knew that uh, Nancy Pelosi said the other day that they didn't approve anything, didn't approve anything, but now it's okay because they have a new president. That's exactly what she said. Yeah. yeah it's and, okay and, now because we have a new president. Well, and we can make sure that it's, you know, that, well, it, and the problem is, honestly, in a lot of cases, and let's remember this, it wasn't just Democrats that were the problem. It was also Senate Republicans that were masquerading as deficit hawks because nobody's a deficit hawk in Washington anymore. Um, it's trying to say that they were concerned about the budget. And I'll give them some some props on that. But it wasn't just one side or the other. What, what is interesting is Mnuchin legitimately wanted this before the election. So did the president. I think so did a lot of Democrats and Republicans. The leadership didn't because they think political before they think about you. Okay, <laughs> let's go to Steve in Royal Oak. Steve, good afternoon. Steve, are, the, are you there? All right. I, I'll spin the wheel one more time and see what comes up. Tom is in Wixom uh, with some thoughts about, I guess, the water shutoffs. Hi, Tom. I won't let you down. I'm on. There you are. <laughs> you know, at first you don't succeed. Yeah, yeah. So I just thought it was a little self-serving to hear Mayor Duggan talk about uh, no shutoffs to 2022 when there's no doubt in a couple of days, he's going to announce his re-election for mayor of Detroit. So. I think he's doing it today. He may be doing it now. Um, All right. Well, even better. Yeah. Cool. 
Yeah, I, I can I, I see what you're saying. My concern is from a fiscal standpoint, just to make sure that the city can pay for it, because obviously after the bankruptcy, you've got to be sensitive to that. But the other thing is, I just don't want to create an expectation that the water bill is the last thing that you have to pay in households in Detroit because someone else will bail you out. No and, water and pun is, intended. Is it, literally, is it literally in the city of Detroit or anyone on the uh, city water system can decide not to pay the bills now i think that's city of detroit residents only because they are handled by a, through a separate billing agency in the city of detroit is my understanding i mean they still okay. have to, so right. I, I think that is separately negotiated and i apologize usually i'm on top of things i was looking national today and we're also focusing as we said on occ so i had different things i was looking at today but yeah we can do a deeper dive into that i do think that that is a it's I, I know from a humanitarian standpoint, it's been a big, big problem. But we also cannot go back to the days when people just didn't pay their water bill because they knew there would be no repercussions. Uh, thanks for your call, Tom, and for uh, for po- <laughs> for punching through. Let's travel to Emily City. Mike, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I think one of the reasons um, Miss Pelosi runs the house, nobody else has anything to say there. Um, one of the things is, she wanted to hold that the, um, the deduction for state and local income taxes. Um, she wanted to reduce, you know, eliminate that, um, you know, ban or whatever you would call it. Well, it's, um, yeah, I mean, they, they eradicated the deduction, and so high-tax states now, they're getting hammered by it, but that's because they didn't exercise any fiscal restraint in the first place, right? Yeah, well, people that pay over $10,000 in local income tax i would imagine they probably make over two hundred thousand dollars a year too i so she's holding out for rich people and our representatives here dan kildee for uh for certain and debbie dingle and everybody else they really don't have um an iron in this an iron in the grill here they they really can't do anything because she is the boss she's the queen and there's absolutely nothing they could do. They could tell her that she's wearing, um, that her uh, mask is below her nose. It wouldn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, and I don't want to take that metaphor any farther than that. Um, if, Mike, thanks so much. You're absolutely right that salt does play a role in this, I think, uh, for Democrats. It's just the, the callousness of this that again people in leadership I, I truly believe there are many uh, politicians on both sides of the aisle that want to serve the public first and aren't so worried about making sure that they got political points to score that seems to be her only motivation uh, we'll continue taking your calls but coming up uh, at 347 here we're going to be talking with Jolene Chapman about the incredible opportunities Oakland Community College has if you're looking at engineering that's next on the Guy Gordon show here's Michael Stetz WJR traffic first this report is sponsored by the Exergen Temporal Scanner. Fever is the leading sign of COVID-19. Use an accurate thermometer for twice daily checks. Protect your loved ones with the Exergen Temporal Scanner. It takes an accurate reading in seconds and is the only home thermometer recommended Sorry, Mike, by I hospitals, physicians, and clinics. The, uh, Stay safe with Exergen. Comments. In the city on the Jeffries um, eastbound between Evergreen and the Southfield, the left shoulder blocked still due to an earlier vehicle fire. Expect delays. In Macomb County, you're moving slowly on M59 eastbound right now between Man- uh, Mountain Road and Van Dyke. And in Oakland County, road construction has the left lane closed right now on 696 eastbound between Southfield Road and Coolidge. That's that construction scheduled through 3 p.m. on Friday. Now, WJR Weather First from the Weather Channel, sponsored by the National Electrical Contractors Association, NECA, and IBEW Local 58. Put the expertise and skill of NECA signatory contractors and IBEW electricians to work on your commercial, public, industrial, or residential construction project. Safety and proper PPE use matter more than ever. Start safe, stay safe. Visit poweringmichigansfuture.com. One inch rain's coming our way for the weekend. A change to the weather patterns means uh, cold fronts coming our way again this weekend and next week. They've been missing in action for a while. Our high today, uh, 46, good 10 degrees warmer than average. Low tonight, 29. Tomorrow, partly cloudy, 42. Friday, cloudy, 45. I'm meteorologist Scott Laurie and more on News Talk 760 WJR. Sorry, guy. What were you trying to say? No, I was just going to, I was going to reach out to Anita Rose. Uh, Where the heck is Decorah, Iowa? Oh, the uh, the former AM radio. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. you know what my radio station was in college? Have I ever told you this? It was Central's. I know that. It was, it was well. There were two at Central. There was WCHP that worked out of Anspaugh Hall, 
And then in Thorpal, which is where I lived, was W I N O, Wino Radio. <laughs> it was. You have told me this. It was the takeoff of the old George Carlin routine, right? We were oh, I thought through. it was just because Central's a party school. Well, there was some of that too. I mean, yeah, but we, yeah, we. We operated out of Thorpal. I think it went under about four years after I left. But I was station manager there for a while, and at least kept us on the air for two years. Uh, but so there was like, so there's like an NPR station, and then there was like a like a college college radio. So station. there was WCMU, which is NPR, WMHW, which was the FM station out of Moore Hall, which is what all the broadcast majors worked on, and then two little AM stations where a lot of us exactly cut our teeth, and a lot of guys in Detroit radio. Uh, started at CHP, um, but Dave, you know, guys like Dave Llewellyn, he worked with us at Wino for a while, um, and a lot of different pieces. Northeast corner of Iowa. Okay, Anita. Sound, that sounds cold. I don't know why that sounds cold to me. Well, it sounds windy this time of year. We, we pass through Iowa. Man, I, I tell you what, uh, you want to talk about a state that has got a ton of windmills now. Iowa has to be generating everything they need off of windmills because you just see them everywhere. Well, I hope their I hope their phones are working better than those two calls in a row. Our guy from uh, our guy from uh, uh, Wixom bailed us out. I know. I, I thought the one guy was calling from the Enbridge Tunnel that hasn't been dug yet. <laughs> right. It's like I, I can't talk. I'm going through a tunnel. It's like oh, it's just, well, sorry to disturb you. Does, does Dana Nessel know about it? Because she's going to try to shut that sucker down. You know, there's for the people watching, there's this moment of panic when you get two bad phone calls in a row because then you start thinking, uh-oh, our phones are down and we're going to have to tap dance. So when, when that third person comes in and you can hear him, it's a big sigh of relief. It was really confusing for me, though, because I was talking to someone on the phone, but I knew the same panic. I had the same panic as Mike. Yeah. Never, never fails. Yeah. Well, we don't we know. What... Never, we never panic. Not here. Ever. And not, not visibly. I knew it. Always 10 degrees colder than the rest of the state. Maybe yeah. it's the north. Well, oh. so well, Mount Pleasant was the same way. Of course, there oh. really isn't a mountain in oh. Mount Pleasant. We all know that, right? Right. But it is flat, and boy, the wind chill oh. there was always Here we bad. You. You are listening to a special edition of The Guy Gordon Show for a spotlight on Oakland Community College on WJR. With an OCC education, the possibilities are virtually unlimited. Enroll today. Once again, here's Guy. We want Michigan to be the land of opportunity, but you have to seize the opportunity yourself. And in many cases, that means enrolling in extended learning, higher learning. And that's why we're focusing and so excited to focus on Oakland Community College, because as I said in the earlier interview we did with the chancellor, I can think of few value propositions that deliver as much as your tuition at Oakland Community College. Jolene Chapman is, <laughs> excuse me, is the Dean of Engineering, Manufacturing, and Industrial Technology. I think I have some metal shavings in my throat here, Jolene. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> This is what happens when you talk for a living. Uh, yeah. in, in, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but in terms of those fields of endeavor that have maybe the biggest impact on your bottom line as an income earner, is engineering the one that delivers perhaps the best return on an education investment? Well, uh, engineering, of course, is a four-year degree. Uh, we have two-year associate degrees at OCC, but we have um, industrial technologies that uh, lead into engineering programs. Uh, so the programs that we have at OCC in, in our engineering, manufacturing, and industrial technologies division are programs like automobile servicing, collision auto repair, computer-aided design, HVAC, machine tool technology, construction management, robotics, and welding. Well, and we know that two areas that seem to be just screaming for people is engineering and also in the construction industry where they just can't get enough skilled trades. You say it's a two-year degree. Do most mm -hmm. people end up completing it, and are they able to transition to a new job in that span of time? 
So uh, they can get uh, two years of the of the first two years of a four year degree here at OCC and set themselves up really well for that seamless transfer into a four year institution. Uh, they can also get education that enables them to work as an engineering technician or a machine tool technology technician or robotics technician uh, and, and be able to earn a living, a good living doing those sorts of things. Uh, and then if they decide to uh, go on for two more years later, they're certainly set up very well to do that. In terms of the opportunities to to, to polish the apple while you're learning, mm-hmm. um, how many opportunities do people have to actually work in a lab setting? And is that somewhat limited by COVID and, and distancing? Or can they do that off campus in a, more of an apprentice internship type uh, program? <laughs> Yeah, so COVID-19 has certainly sent everybody awry, right? Things are just not what they normally are. And our our course caps have been uh, been limited. So we can only have a few people in the lab when we would normally have a full lab. Um, So we're disappointed that we can't get those students into the lab as often and as as we would like to, although we're allowed as of uh, today to bring students back. So so that's excellent. yeah, you mentioned apprenticeships. Apprenticeship is is an opportunity to learn and earn. So students enroll in a program that um, has been established between the college and the employer, and they follow this uh, scripted path of courses, and they they earn money while they learn. And there's a wage progression there that the that the employer has to abide by. So uh, it really is a tremendous opportunity. Uh, we do have uh, apprentices. At, at uh, GM and Lake Orion and um, at Williams International. And while apprenticeships are normally thought of um, in the skilled trades area, they're also in healthcare and uh, information technology. We, we do have apprentices in the Henry Ford Health System as well for medical assisting. So um, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful opportunity uh, to upskill and to, so that you don't have to stop earning while you're learning. You can do both at the same time. Well, and the other thing is, you know, there's the old thing that my dad always harped on. You know, you're way ahead of the game if you have a foot in the door. Right. Right. Yep. That, that is a, that is true. You know, we have employers calling us all the time saying we need people who are job ready. How can we you know, do you have students who are nearing graduation? Well, in skilled trades. Uh, The students don't wait until they're ready to graduate to go looking for jobs. Usually they take two or three classes and then um, unfortunately for us, but fortunately for the students, they get hired into good paying jobs. And so uh, in in an effort to bridge the gap between uh, getting students ready and and what the employer needs, we're rolling out a pre-apprenticeship program uh, that we intend to roll out in March. We hoped it would be sooner, but it's, it's looking like March. It's a, it's a program that will get students job ready. Uh, what's unique about this program, Guy, is that it is free for participants and it's open to people of all ages. It's a short term boot camp style program that prepares students to be work ready. It's five weeks in length and um, people participating in it will learn basic skills like shot math and safety and blueprint reading. And we'll also weave in there some workplace skills like time management and personal accountability and communication. Um, And at the end of those five weeks, we will connect those participants with employers who are looking to establish apprenticeship programs. Jolene, I gotta tell you, that seems tailor-made for some of the young people that I've been talking with that when, when COVID hit, they said, well, I'm not going to spend money on, on education as long as it's going to be virtual in the fall. So mm-hmm. I'm going to take a gap year, the recent high school graduates or a gap, gap semester. That sounds tailor made for them because it's five weeks. They get upskilled. They kind of get their, their head back in the game and then they, they can be ready for summer or fall or whatever comes next once we have a vaccine. Yeah, yeah, it is. That, that would be our, our, our probably our biggest target audience. But again, this is open to anyone who maybe somebody wants to transition, you know, do something completely different. This is an opportunity to, like you said, get a foot in the door and be connected with uh, companies that are looking to uh, have apprentices. 
Beyond that pre-apprenticeship pr- program, though, um, if I'm a young person that's saying, you know, I just want to take a quick bite with OCC, mm-hmm. and then I'm going to move maybe to a four-year university or something else, how transferable are those credits? And because your program is so goal-oriented, where you complete and you have something in your hand that's marketable, do they really need to, to go the full two? So uh, there are some short term programs, but maybe somebody only needs like a one year certificate. Uh, uh, Welding is a perfect example of we don't have a degree in welding, but we have a one year certificate. And if you want to become a career welder, that is the route to go. Now, this pre apprenticeship program is a little different. It's only five weeks. And so while while it's going to be fortified with awesome instruction and people will learn a lot, probably not ready then to go right on to um, a, a four year school probably need a little more to to fortify this is to get them job ready and then we'll work with them and their employers to get them in in a registered apprenticeship where they take classes uh, while they are working with the company so if i am a young person and you've just now inspired me or maybe i'm an adult worker who wants to learn and earn who do I call and and what are, are my uh, opportunities in terms of maybe seeking financial support? How long does that process take, uh, especially if I want to get in for the next round? Yep. So the, the pre-apprenticeship program is free. So it's an investment just of time, not of money for the, the first uh, couple goal rounds. Uh, the best way to get a hold of us, uh, since we're all working remotely, we're, we're very email heavy right now. So the best uh, way would be to send an email to apprenticeship at oaklandcc.edu. Apprentice, apprenticeship mm-hmm. at Oak. OCC, do it again. Yep, apprenticeship at oaklandcc.edu. Oaklandcc.edu. Julie oh. Chapman, thanks so much. We hope they, they flood the gates and we can get a lot of people upskilled and get this economy humming in the new year. Hey, thanks for having me. Take care. Okay. Jolene Chapman, who is uh, the academic dean of, excuse me, the dean of engineering, manufacturing, and industrial tech. Uh, When we come back, uh, more of your calls here on the Guy Gordon Show, and we will, uh, uh, no, we're at 4 o'clock. No, we're going to talk with another gentleman, uh, the dean of public services and combined regional emergency services training, firefighting, public safety, those jobs next on the Guy Gordon Show. Stay tuned. I'll get it right. Here's Michael Stentz. This report is sponsored by the Exergen Temporal Scanner. Fever is the leading sign of COVID-19. Use an accurate thermometer for twice daily checks. Protect your loved ones with the Exergen Temporal Scanner. It takes an accurate reading in seconds and is the only home thermometer recommended by hospitals, physicians, and clinics. Stay safe with Exergen. In Oakland County, road construction has the left lane closed on 696 eastbound between Southfield Road and Coolidge. That construction scheduled until... 3 p.m. on Friday. That's the left lane again that's closed there. In St. Clair Shores, you're a slow go right now on 94 eastbound between 696 and 12 mile. And in Macomb County, you're a slow go on M59 eastbound between Mound Road and Van Dyke. Now, WJR weather first from the Weather Channel. Partly cloudy heading into this evening with a low of 28 tonight. Cloudy again on Thursday with a high tomorrow of 41. Right now, it's 39 degrees. I'm Michael Stetz, WJR News in two minutes. Add guy. So, just for you folks that are watching on Facebook, you know, Laura likes to communicate with me in the middle of the show. This is the text that I get in the middle of the Chapman interview. What drugs are you taking? Hey, Mike, can you turn this down a little bit? Were you suggesting that I appear to be in any way intoxicated or on drugs? I'm sorry. I don't know what you just said. I missed all of it. You're texting me in the middle of an interview asking me what drugs I'm taking. Was there any? Well, you have a prescription bottle behind you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, my God. I left, at the picture? I left my drugs out. I sent you a picture of yourself and circled it. Oh, there it I, I see now. Okay. I know you're on antibiotics. It's, I just had to give you a hard no, time. No, th- those, those, no, that's not oh, antibiotics. Right. Back no, that's not what that is. Podcast. Um, I am going to add those are, those are painkillers going back when I had my back issue this summer, but I'm not on them at the moment. Okay, well, then I guess I had a reason to be concerned. Yeah, you know, I'm going to add David to the and we're going to test him out here and see if he can hear us and if we can hear him. I'm a child of the 60s, I have pill bottles everywhere. Hi, David. Hey. Hi. 
Look at you. You've got a fancy schmancy backdrop. You are totally Zoom ready. Yeah, I'm working in the office, so I'm not remote. Okay. Good enough. Did um, the, yeah, that all that all looks good. Looks great. You look fine. Um, anything in particular that you want to hammer really, uh, really hard off the top? No, whatever you're, whatever you want to talk about, we can talk about. I, I do want to say this though. I grew up watching, not that sounds bad. I grew up watching you my whole life, so it's kind of cool to get to talk to you. Well, <laughs> no, that's okay. We all grew up watching. The guys. sad thing is, I've had guys a lot older than you tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I love dice. You're in my so, house every day. I have been to your um, your facility, your training facility for firefighters. That's quite okay. a that's quite a Hollywood uh, Hollywood back st- uh, back set there, or what it, is, call it, it really is back lot. Yeah. The, the city and everything. Absolutely. Do you, do you know the story behind that piece of property? It used to be a Nike uh, missile missile base. Yeah. Not too many people know that. <laughs> yeah, they the they come out and uh, test the ground every now and then to make sure we're you know there's no one's going to glow from what's what was out there or whatever. Yeah, and I don't know if there was anything radioactive actually. I know they I capped know. them and filled it with, but they you know, did. What people don't realize is that Detroit was the last line of defense for incoming Russian missiles coming over the polar cap. And so we had, I think at one point, 14 different Nike missile bases yeah. here around Detroit. It was one of the last stories I was going to do for Local 4 before I left and came to JR, and I ran out of time. But <laughs> your facility, I mean, you can still see kind of the coffins where the yeah. missiles used to be. Yep, they have them up there, the steel grates or thing, plates over them, yeah. yeah it's Pretty kind cool. of, uh, it's it's a cool piece of history. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, there, there were some on Belle Isle. There's a big one that um, is down near Carlton in Monroe County that's still, you can look at these things from Google Earth. Yeah, for, and for those of you that are history nuts and nerdy like me, obviously, <laughs> um, if you Google Michigan Nike missile bases, there's a whole Wikipedia page, and then you can go on Google Earth and find them. That's really cool. uh, and you can still s- s- kind of see the remnants of them. Selfridge had one. Metro yeah. Airport, there was one on the eastern uh, part of Metro Airport now. That's It's underneath the runway, but it's it's all cool history. That is cool history. So have you seen um, have you seen a rise in demand for uh, public safety jobs, or are you seeing, because of all of the controversy this year, that things are, are tougher than normal? And I'll ask you that when we get in the interview, but I'm just curious. I, I'm seeing there's more demand. But there's also, I cannot believe how many people are signing up for the classes. Our, our next police academy is, I, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. We've got a waiting list. There's so many people. That's terrific. God, that's great news. Um, and, and David, it's, is it CC? Yes, sure yes, get... sir. Yes, sir. Okay, good enough. That's great. Did you come out of public safety yourself? or? Yes, I was a police officer prior to, to getting this job. Really? And where? So I was a police officer uh, at Oakland Community College. Okay. I was a police officer in the city of Lake Angeles as well. All righty. Well, those are those are hellraisers in in Lake Angeles. Yeah. That's, <laughs> you know, you got those keggers on pontoons. Uh, it's yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've I, I've uh, I've I've had had some good friends that lived out there. That that's just a great great spot. Had I it been is. able to make it, I would have I would have bought a house on Lake Angeles in a heartbeat if I could, had been able to make it to Channel Seven you know, for a breaking news situation. I really needed to be about 20 minutes away max from the station. Right. So I was, yeah. There was yeah, kind of a true. radius there that I had to. <clears throat> Cause it is a nice community. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And it's a beautiful lake. Um, all righty. Well, we'll dive into it here in the middle. I think Mike's got to hit, hit our intro. And we'll... Yeah. We're about uh, 45 seconds away here. All right. So I'm going to put you backstage real quick, David, and uh, we'll be with you okay. in less than a minute. Sounds good. By the way, I'm back. Did we did we figure out what was in that pill bottle behind you? Yeah, it's called Baclofen, and and, and they are some pain. Uh, it's muscle relaxants from when I screwed up my back in July. I'm gonna have David send some of his friends out to investigate you. That's okay. I you know. <laughs> All right, here we come. We're back in twenty. But if this doesn't go well, Mike, I'm gonna be guzzling them, and it's on your head. A few more. We're one or two missed calls away. Okay. Yeah. Right. If we have another uh, two drop calls, I might join you. Okay. Here we come.
Welcome to a special edition of The Guy Gordon Show on News Talk 760 WJR for a spotlight on Oakland Community College. With an OCC education, the possibilities are virtually unlimited. Enroll today. Here's Guy Gordon. We have so many institutions of higher learning here in Southeast Michigan, and we're so blessed to have them. And we have the uh, the uh, research, University Research Corridor, and all of them are what makes Michigan competitive and will ensure our competitiveness going forward. Uh, but few can give you the quick launch that Oakland Community College can. And I want to check in with David Cece. He's the Academic Dean of Public Services and Combined Regional Emergency Services Training, also known as CREST. But we're talking police, fire, EMS, public safety. David, great to have you with us. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it, Mr. Board. I got to tell you, uh, the I've been out to your training academy there, and I would think that you must have a lot of demand for other departments to come out there and use this because, I mean, this is like a Hollywood backlot in terms of firefighting. We do. We have agencies from all over the state coming out here, some federal agencies, too, that come to rent the site, to utilize the facilities, uh, fire departments utilizing that the, the fire tower that we have. We are busy five, six days a week out there on that site with agencies. They, it's, it's a great training facility. It really is. I mean, do other public service academies have that kind of infrastructure for that kind of hands-on training? No one else has that in the state of Michigan. Um, the closest you would get would be Camp Grayling, and that's a military base. So right. they have a little more resources than we do. But no other no other police academy, fire academy, EMS academy has the uh, the training facility like we do. And I would have to think, and we're you know these days we're talking a lot about police training that that kind of hands on, maybe it's a shoot don't shoot exercise, or it is you know executing a search warrant entering a home, doing it safely. There's no substitute for experience. And so I've, I've got to imagine that you're in pretty high demand. How's enrollment? Enrollment is phenomenal. Our fire academy uh, that's coming up is almost full. The police academy is, is at capacity. Um, our EMS academy, our EMT and paramedic academy are also doing really well. Um, the When I talk to the people about why they're getting into it, most of them say it's because of what they're seeing on, on, on the news and, and in the media. And they want to show people that law enforcement officers are not um, uh, bad people, that they're good people. They want to they wanna make that change. They want to be that change in the industry. So we really are not seeing any downturn. We're in fact, in fact, enrollment is up. It's, it's interesting that you say that because in talking with buddies of mine that are sheriffs and police chiefs, and, and they have, and maybe it's because of, it's an urban environment, and, but they are finding that it's getting a little bit harder. So I can't tell you how encouraging that is to, to hear that. What kind of changes do you think we may be seeing coming down the road? And what kind of changes have you made to your curriculum? Um, not huge adjustments, but how is the, the uh, education of future law enforcement officers changing because of the George Floyd incident and, and just because it's a constantly evolving discipline? So <clears throat> we, we kind of were ahead of the curve on this um, before this 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 situation became you know in the, the public consciousness we had already decided we wanted to start implementing things like implicit bias training um and, and uh de-escalation training and we have been doing it for a couple of years now before all this this came into place so we're position we've positioned ourselves in a great spot to be ready for what's coming um for what the governor has as enacted in in uh the senate bill 954 for uh, law enforcement training uh, we're already there. We're already doing what, what, what they want us to do. Um, we, we are, you know, training in, in use of force. The, like you said, shoot, don't shoot scenarios. We have a use of force simulator that allows us to give those kind of scenarios to the students so they get that hands-on practicality. And I'll, I'll tell you, uh, we are doing a lot more hands-on. And one of the things that we do is that we do a, a scenario that deals with duty to act. You know, your partner is doing something right. wrong. We expect the cadets to, to learn from that. We have those scenarios. They are mandatory that we put our cadets through those scenarios to test them on those ethical situations. So the hands-on, I think, is one of the big things that we're doing right now. We're putting them in those live scenarios. And, and the students really walk away from that saying, I learned so much. They take that book learning, the didactic learning, and they go out there on that site, and they are able to implement it in real-life situations. One of, when you talk to departments, what is it they're looking for in terms of temperament maybe not you know um the, the the you know the soft skills that everybody needs but what are they looking for and have they changed what they are looking for i 
I think they're they're they are still looking for strong individuals who who are confident can handle themselves, but they are looking for people who also can have that empathy and and ha- have those some of those soft skills, being good listeners, effective communicators. Um, that's one of the big things I, I I've been getting from a lot of the the chiefs is you know we need we need more effective communicators. They they need more 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 time on that how to talk to people mm-hmm. because they feel that some of the social media is is you know in, impacting those skills um because we don't have as much face-to-face communication no question and that's just not in your line of work it's in my line of work too it's people just aren't very very precise in the way that they talk or communicate and sometimes that precision and those nuances can mean so much especially in a high stress situation yes. like your graduates will find themselves in um Go back to implicit bias training, because I think there's a lot of a misunderstanding and maybe a little bit of grievance about that, because it presumes that we all are biased. And I don't know a lot of us that will accept that. So t- tell me how you walk that line in an implicit bias training and why you think it's important. So the, the implicit bias training, it, it we all have some sort of biases. And I think sometimes people take having a bias with, 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 uh, you know, racial prejudice or something like that. It's not always that it could be gender or, or body type or things like that. And what we, we try to do is, is acknowledge that those exist mm-hmm. work to overcome those, um, make sure that people are cognizant that they have those. So when they're out there dealing with the public and the community, that those aren't impacting their performance. Um, it, it's, it's, it's just another way of, of introspection and, and helping people look at at how they communicate, really. Um, I, but I think the reason that there's it, it's tagged so with that negative connotation is people think it means automatically, you know, racist or pre, a pre, a prejudiced based on those type of things, when it's not always necessary. Or that you're going to be judged, and that's not the case. It's right. just to make you more self-aware. Absolutely. That these could be in you. Watch for the warning sign. Absolutely. That, and that is, we talk about, like you said, those, those kind of that warning sign. That's a good way to put it. We, we talk about that in those classes to look for those type of things. Yeah. Why am I resenting this person right. upon a first encounter? Yep. Uh, David Cece, we wish you so well. Nothing uh, but success for the officers you graduate. And we hope they all have safe careers and, and rewarding careers. Thanks so much for what you're doing at OCC and that Crest Training Academy. Off the charts, amazing. We're very, very proud to have that in our community. Thank you, sir. You take care. David Cece, who is the uh, Dean of Public Services. When we come back, he is going to be chairing the committee tomorrow that has the responsibility of reviewing the Pfizer vaccine. We'll speak live with Dr. Arnold Monto next on The Guy Gordon Show, less than 24 hours before they pass judgment. But first, let's get to Michael Stetz, WJR Traffic. In Oakland County, road construction has the left lane closed on 696 eastbound between Southfield Road and Coolidge. That's scheduled um, until 3 p.m. on Friday. In St. Clair Shores, you're a slow go right now on 94 eastbound between 696 and 12 mile. And in Macomb County, you're moving slowly right now on M59 eastbound between Mound Road and Van Dyke. Now WJR weather first from the Weather Channel. Well, cold fronts being allowed back into the lakes starting this weekend. One uh, coming on through Saturday with some one-inch rains. Big drop to the number uh, for Sunday and Monday early next week. And uh, cold fronts returning to our forecast next week. High today, 46. Good 10 degrees warmer than average. Low tonight, 29. Tomorrow, partly cloudy, 42. I'm meteorologist Scott Laurie. More on News Talk 760 WJR. So was uh, uh, Laura, was Dr. Monto going to be joining us uh, via stream? So no, can... he'll be on the phone. Okay. And because um, I, I was going to ask him for a refill. Um, <laughs> you know, that yeah, that's something I'm going to do for you. you to... No, Laura. If once you do that once, it's your job. Don't even go down that road. Guy, we've set strict boundaries. I'm not your secretary. No, but I thought you were st- would still hook me up with drugs. I mean, that is a producer's. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I'm sure Stern's producer does that. <laughs> I don't. I don't know what happens at Channel Four, but that doesn't happen oh. here. Yeah, that... right, guy. This isn't TV news of the '80s, okay? Yeah, no, that was actually Channel Seven. And don't get me started yeah. on those stories. Why not? We have some time. Yeah, well, because all the yeah. all of the uh, the names would have to be changed to uh, yeah. protect the innocent. May make you drowsy or dizzy. The question is, would you notice? Um, 
Chris Meller has some glowing things to say about the OCC Crest uh, facility, by the way. Oh, it is cool. I mean, the first time I saw it, and, you know, it's also to do you to kind of do high-rise uh, firefighting rescues mm-hmm. and things like that. It's, uh, it's pretty impressive. Yeah, that's cool. I didn't know that. Uh... Oh, I didn't realize that. Mark says that he graduated from the OCC Academy. Good on you, man. Where are you? Are you still serving in uh, public safety, Mark? Or are you? Uh, I you feel like he's mentioned. Yeah, I feel like he's mentioned he's law. He's he's he was law enforcement. I could be mistaken. Yeah. Well, you know, if there, if uh, if there is some radiation left over from the uh, from the missile site, what better training ground? You know. Yeah. For. Uh... <laughs> I don't think they had nuclear warheads. That's good. Um, yeah, I think they had. I think it was conventional warheads back in those days. Some of them did, but I don't think ours did. In fact, here's, you know, when, when I was a kid, they had them near Chicago, and my grandfather. We'd, I'd go visit my grandfather, and he no, would take me by to see the birthday. what we they called the Nikki missile base. They didn't know that it was Nike. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Dr. I heard... Monto is there, guy. Uh, Dr. Monto is there? <laughs> Outstanding. Okay. Yeah, I've, I've never heard of Nike missiles, much like I was uh, confu- confused when I first heard about Michelin chefs. All right, we're back in uh, 10 seconds here. This is the Guy Gordon Show on News Talk 760 WJR. Well, tomorrow perhaps is the beginning of the end when we speak about COVID-19. That is the day when the FDA's Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee will be meeting uh, to advise the FDA on whether to give emergency authorization to the Pfizer vaccine. And the gentleman that's going to be chairing that committee is on the other end of our line. Dr. Arnold Monto is a professor with the Department of Epidemiology at the School of Public Health at the University of Michigan and is in this very important role. Dr. Monto, good afternoon and congratulations on uh, taking such an important role here. Well, we'll wait until tomorrow and see how the committee uh, votes because we will have a a vote on whether we think the authorization should go through. A recommendation, I should say. I've got to imagine that you have been living under a mountain of data at this point, and just give us a sense of what you and members of your committee have been going through in this important exercise. Well, the interesting thing is that because it's so transparent, if you go on the website for this committee, which the abbreviation is a verb pack, you will see the two major reports that we're going to be looking at. One comes from Pfizer, and the other is FDA's reanalysis of the data that was submitted to them uh, and other things that they know about in terms of what happens after approvals. Well, the differences between you and me is we can both online go online and get them, but you will actually understand what you're reading. I would not. So as you as you look at those reports, what is your level of confidence that this is both effective, because we've seen a lot of news on that, but also safe? Well, the data look pretty good. And uh, I have to say, uh, uh, they get I get in trouble if I don't say this is just my personal view and not of sure. the committee or <laughs> FDA. <laughs> um, but they look, they look pretty good. We work a lot with flu vaccine and flu vaccine at good years about 60 percent effective 50 60 percent and fda in their guidance to industry said they would approve a vaccine for use if it was more than 50 percent effective we've got a vaccine which in all kinds of groups looks like it's more than 90 percent effective so i think we're we really hit a home run here And part of it's because there's only one part of this virus that you have to produce antibody to 
that right. seems to re- result in protection. So it's a it it's, it it turned out that a weird a weird infection that's so complicated. Making a vaccine against it may have been more simple than we thought. Well, we'll take uh, those those blessings in disguise, Doctor. I'll tell you that um, when you. When you look at this, and I've heard this from some callers, they're worried because they hear the term RNA, and they're worried that this vaccine will actually change their DNA. Does it do anything like that, or does it act as a messenger to jumpstart your immune system? Well, what it does, it goes into your muscle, and there inside it produces the stuff that the body has to produce antibodies against. So instead of injecting that stuff, it's actually manufactured by the body. But this mRNA doesn't last very long. That's one of the reasons why we have to keep it under very cold temperatures. Mm -hmm. So it'll be destroyed. And therefore, we think these vaccines are pretty safe. Safe. Of course, we've only had a a short time since they started getting used. So we're going to have to watch. Right. And I guess and I, I want to get to that in a moment. But, you know, those of us that are going to be taking them. We want to know that they're going to be safe, that they won't harm us. But there may be some short term side effects. What have you heard about the Pfizer vaccine that we should know so that we are we can anticipate that there may be some discomfort, uh, discomfort at the injection site and maybe something beyond that? What are you hearing? What we're seeing actually with the data that uh, Pfizer has provided and uh, is that Sore arms are very common. Uh, They don't seem to be any worse. You have to get the shot twice, the the first shot or the second arm, the second shot. Uh, More concerning than that, and this is only a minor concern, uh, a percentage of people just don't feel well about within the first 18 hours after getting the shot. That seems to be more common with the second shot. Mm -hmm. Now, anybody who's got the... Uh, the herpes zoster vaccine, the shingles vaccine, knows that that shot gives you some uh, side effects as well. And it's a, a, about at the same level. So it's, a, it's, 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 it's something we can live with. Well, we can certainly, we, we may feel a little bit of punky, but that's better than being on a ventilator. It, it's absolutely a trade-off. It always is. Every, nothing in life is not a trade-off. We did hear a a report out of the U.K. uh, early this morning that perhaps people with severe allergies uh, should be cautioned about the the COVID vaccine. What do you know about that and how big of a concern is that? Or is this quite uh, quite normal? No, it's 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 a question of how much of a, a reaction they have. And I know as much as you do, I think we'll hear more about it tomorrow because that is something that did not show up during the trials, even though the trials involve 30, 40,000 people. Uh, So it's kind of uh, surprising, but it may be that people with severe allergies were excluded from the the trial. That's why it's very important to follow after we start using the vaccine, because uh, uh, even though people with underlying conditions and older people and minorities were all included, there may be other kinds of people will ha- that will have what we call idiosyncratic reactions. So, obviously, there are, there are an awful lot of people, far too many, that are still resistant, perhaps even more than 50% in some ethnic groups. What is the one thing you can tell them about this process where we've jammed 8 to 10 years of research into 8 months that can give them a higher level of confidence in this vaccine? Well, the jamming is really telescoping. Things that usually are done in sequence were being done at the same time. Okay. And the reason people, companies, could take risks is that a lot of money was thrown at this by the federal government. And that helped telescope the process. It also helped have very large studies with a lot of people recruited. And this this should actually give us more confidence about the safety because there have been a lot of people included in these trials. 
And in terms of looking for side effects, I think instead of uh, they had a 60-day a window where they um, watched these people, which was longer than normal, and I f- at least find reassurance in that, we always know that there are going to be unknowns, that even with the most vigorous studies, that there are still things that you aren't going to know until it gets out into the general population. What's the biggest unknown right now that might not keep you awake at night, but you really want to know? Well, the thing that I'd like to know is uh, duration and duration of protection, whether we're going to need booster shots. It doesn't bother me if we do need booster shots. I suspect knowing how these viruses uh, behave uh, in people, we have a whole family of coronaviruses that just cause mild uh, illness in most people, common colds, and people get reinfected with them. But if it's going to be if we're going to need booster shots, we're going to have to work out how often, but we're used to that kind of thing with flu. So uh, it really doesn't bother me as long as we can control the pandemic because this is really uh, so so much longer than we thought that we'd be in lockdown and, and, right. and related situations. Is this going to be a situation where we can say, as we did with smallpox, that we have eradicated it? Or is this going to be one of those things where we're going to need to be prepared for perhaps new strains raising their ugly head? Well, I don't know that we're going to need to be prepared uh, for new strains. I think the problem is that this virus is everywhere. If it's not spreading here, it's going to be spreading other, other places. But it's got to be something we can manage, like the flu. Remember, we had a big right. pandemic of flu in 1918. That virus lasted and was still around, and, uh, and, and variants of that virus are still around. But it doesn't cause that severe a, a disease right now. Mm-hmm. And that's what we would hope for. Building up enough immunity in the, in the bodies of Americans that at least they have that measure of immunity that they can fight off whatever else it it, it may evolve into uh when will how long will this meeting last tomorrow that you're chairing well we're scheduled from 9 a.m to 5 15 and you can watch it on youtube it's we'll, going to be uh, live streamed well we uh, we hope you don't have to wield the gavel uh, too recklessly and that it the is the virtual uh, gavel. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, uh, we're honored it's that all you being have done from my house in Ann Arbor. <laughs> okay. Everything's virtual. We're honored that you are playing this role and a Michigander is going to be playing such an important role here and we will await the judge's verdict tomorrow, Dr. Arnold Monto. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. And we'll just we'll just pray for a really good internet connection for Dr. Monto tomorrow. Oh, we don't want any technological gremlins. Uh, your calls when we come back. Your thoughts on what's going to be happening tomorrow. Are you prepared to accept it with FDA approval? 1-800-859-0957. 1-800-859-0WJR. Let's get to Michael in your traffic. Back with more on The Guy Gordon Show. This report is sponsored by the Exergen Temporal Scanner. Don't take chances with COVID-19 and your family's health. Use the Exergen Temporal Scanner to check temperatures before dinner and before you leave home. It takes an accurate reading in seconds and is the number one thermometer recommended by hospitals, doctors, and nurses. Stay safe with Exergen. WJR Traffic First, sponsored by Shelving.com. Finish the year strong and save 11% on industrial storage from shelving.com. Double your floor space instantly with modular mezzanines or maximize vertical height with in-stock Unirack pallet racking up to 20 feet high. Don't miss 11% off the storage your business needs with code wrap up 11. That's shelving.com. We rack your world. In Oakland County, road construction has the left lane closed on 696 eastbound between Southfield Road and Coolidge. That construction scheduled through 3 p.m. on Friday. In Wayne County, you're moving slowly on 94 westbound between the Lodge and Linwood Street. And in St. Clair Shores, you're a slow go right now on 94 eastbound between 696 and 12 Mile. Now, WJR Weather First from the Weather Channel, sponsored by Primetime Testing Laboratory. In need of testing that automotive project? Primetime Testing Labs are the industry's best in complete automotive testing services. They guarantee on-time delivery, accurate result reporting, and are A2LA accredited. For your automotive project, get a free quote at primetimetestinglab.com. That's primetimetestinglab.com. Partly cloudy heading into this evening with a low of 28 tonight. 
Cloudy again on Thursday with a high tomorrow of 41. Right now it's 39 degrees. I'm Michael Stetz, WGR News in one minute. So we got a couple, uh, uh, oh, Mike, closed circuit for you, um, construction, EGH. That's funny. I was just going to tell you, 344. Okay, so after we do our calls? All righty. Yeah. We, gotta, we I, I didn't notice whether we reset. Are Bob and Catherine still there? No, I'm going to reset in a couple of minutes. Well, they are still there, but we've got other calls too. Okay, fine. I just wanted to make sure that we had someone to go to. Otherwise, I'd pull up something else. Yeah, yep, you do. I'm interested to find out how I'm going to communi uh, communicate to remind you to do uh, it at 344. Um, I was going to go with a flare uh, or, yeah. an, or a Nike missile. <laughs> right. Um, I was going to do American Sign Language myself, but I don't know it. By the way, for anybody that's listening, this poor pilot from the Air Wisconsin National Guard who yeah. went down in the UP, say a prayer for that man. I got to tell you, we the we feel a kinship to Wisconsin Air National Guard flies a training routes over our cottage. And when our children were little, I kid you not, my wife wrote a letter to the Wisconsin Air National Guard to asking, keep it down. Yeah, because they were running A fours right at oh. nap time. Wait, she really? She, she wrote a letter to the U.S. military to state to ask them to stay the state quiet. of Wisconsin, the Air, Air National Guard, and and she said, you know, could you just send them maybe twenty miles further north? <laughs> I have only <laughs> met Gail once, and it was for five seconds. But this doesn't surprise me. I know she's a very self assured woman, and I it was. But Did it you ever was hear funny. back? We they it was like on the dot at one p.m. that they would come over, and, and when they come over. It sounds like someone has ripped the sky open. And well, I was playing golf with a guy once, and he said, you know what that is, son? He goes, that's the sound of freedom. And he's right. Well, a couple things. I mean, not, not trying to give any parenting advice, um, you know, <laughs> retrospectively, but could she maybe have adjusted nap time to the – like, was 1 o'clock, like, what, was she really married to 1 o'clock or – she is as Don't dedicated to a, she's as dedicated to a schedule as Laura is. Okay? Oh, I can respect that. So did uh, did you ever I have hear very back? two strong-willed women in my life, and both of you are on that score very very similar. Yeah, I, and you still seem to not follow our schedules at home or at work. If you're late, you're dead. So so yeah, guy, I uh, I, I mean, uh, give me some uh, give, give me some payoff on the story. Do you ever hear back? Did they did they just stop, start changing the schedule without telling you guys? I, for the life of me, do not remember. I just remember the whole notion of her asking because it was like, "What kind of aircraft are they flying?" And I said, "I think they're A 4s and, and she said, "Okay." So she wanted to make sure that she had that right. <laughs> And uh, for Michigan State fans, if it's if it's any consolation, they flew right over Camp Michigania and disrupted them too. The U of M University of Michigan uh, family camp up there. Did you find yourself being hassled by security at the airport more often after this? No, no. It's uh, no. The only place where I had a problem with security was at a at the nuclear plants. Um, that's that's security. I mean, uh, yeah. I, I guess if there's a place you don't mind being patted down, it's at the nuclear facility. They, they, pat like I with, get it. They pat with the, I'm sure they don't teach that at, at OCC, that kind of a pat down, nor do they want to. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe the pre Oh. Uh, what were you doing at a nuclear power plant? I, it was, a, it was a story. Oh. They made, they made you wear these little badges that were going to turn color if you're exposed to radiation. And it's like, Wow. By the time that thing's turned color, I'm, I, I'm dead anyway. So, well, at least at least they don't have to do an autopsy. Oh, look! You and Mark cro have crossed paths before, guy. I'm wondering if that was the the Fallen Heroes event. Or if, because I used to also, I used to do that. I, you know, there are guys that I can't say no to. Mike Bouchard's one of them, and um, 
Bill uh, Dwyer out in out in Warren. Um, that you know, if they call me to do a one of their events with their people, I'm not going to say no to them because they're all they're just such great guys. Right. Yeah, I I run into a lot of people who say Guy Gordon back in back in this year I met him at this dinner or this speech. You actually gave you gave the I, I think you gave an orientation speech or or something at my sister's central Michigan orientation back in 2000. So CMU used to, if they're orient, not orientation, it was kind of like their deal closers where they were trying to recruit admissions. So it was like an admissions event. And they had me on as the closer to try to convince these poor young people to choose central Michigan. And, um, and it must have done okay because it kept having me back. And then yeah. I think I got, I think I aged out of it. I, I never told you this guy, but apparently you sat next to my dad next to a in a baseball game one time. Really? What was? Did we have fun together? Was or, I don't know. Yeah. You had mustard on your shirt. You oh, don't know no this guy. No doubt. You don't know this guy, but my car was stolen my uh, first year of college, and it turns out that you're the one who stole it. I. <laughs> well, I. No one loves to joyride more than me. Right. It was a it was a it was a Pontiac Grand Prix, so you probably like that that torque of that V six. So Ronald on, on Facebook was saying that his wife is really losing sleep over this vaccine. I don't know, you know, and it's funny with people that have these fears, you know, they're rational and usually infor more information helps them. So maybe if you if she were to watch that thing tomorrow on YouTube, maybe that would help her, Ronald. I don't know. Um uh, we're back in 15 here, guy. It's kind of like people that are afraid of flying. Once you teach them the physics, the, the dynamics of flight, they sometimes do better. But you're right. I, you know, <laughs> got killed off. <laughs> uh. Welcome back to a special edition of the Guy Gordon Show on WJR for a spotlight on Oakland Community College. With an OCC education, the possibilities are virtually unlimited. Enroll today. Here's Guy. Welcome back, everybody. Got a special guest coming up uh, in a few minutes here that you'll want to stay tuned for. And if you're watching on StreamYard, you can actually see him. And I understand he has some new facial hair. At least that's what I've heard. I haven't seen him in person in ages. But uh, we've got him coming up at uh, 447 with a special announcement about what we're going to be doing tomorrow. In the meantime, we've got some good callers on the line at 1-800-859-0957, 1-800-859-0WJR. Let's go to Herbin Novi with some thoughts on what sounds like a couple of Democrats admitting that they delayed your COVID relief because they wanted to get the election out of the way, that there was a partisan reason for it. Hi, Herb. Hey, Guy. Great show as usual. Uh, there's no my, there's no question in my mind that the uh, COVID delay was politically motivated. Uh, the truth is, I think if it would have come out, uh, President Trump would have won the election. Another thing that comes to my mind is, in all the months before the election, in fact, since he took office, uh, President Trump has been berating the drug companies and trying to get them to lower their prices. And would you believe that the day after the election, they announced that big COVID news? If they would have um, announced it before the election, uh, he probably would have got reelected because people would have thought that he kept his promise. Why did they wait until no, the day Herb. after? No, it wasn't a day after. It was actually two weeks after. And the, and the fact no, is, this was set in stone. They had to have 50% of their participants in a 60-day trial period. They had to look at them for 60 days before they could start the next phase of the process, which is divulging whether it was safe and effective. They could release some of those efficacy numbers, but they weren't going to have approval of the vaccine until now. This was as fast as they could go because of that 60-day window. And why do we have it? Because they wanted to make sure that people knew that it was safe. And if you shortened that, there I could have shown you all kinds of polling that would have said that the, the confidence level would have fallen. So you had to strike the right balance. And a political, a, pol a partisan or a political consideration should never, ever be part of this. 
It should only be medical. And I'm not saying you're wrong, but it was not to be in the cards when they set the protocols because of that 60-day window, which we need as a buffer for our confidence. Is it just a coincidence that the 60-day buffer was one day after the election? But it wasn't. We're, we, yes, it, it was. We, we, you no. checked your information. Well, okay, I'm not, they made you know, Herb, I'm not going to argue. It's per, you know. if, if you want to have that perception, that's fine. You're a, you certainly have every right to your opinion. I'm telling you uh, that if, if it had looked like, just from a perception standpoint, that they rushed this to politically benefit Donald Trump, the numbers on non-acceptance would be even higher, and they're still troublesome. We've still got a lot of work to do to convince people that this is safe and effective, and, and we've got some here online. Uh, that we're going to get to in a few moments. I thank you for your call, and, and have a great uh, holiday there in Novi. Let's go to Bob in Brighton. Bob apparently agrees with Herb. Hi, Bob. Uh, hi. Good, great show today. Uh, I, yeah, I do, to a little bit, but I don't think it's uh, politically motivated. My issue is that I think the FDA, um, and I listened to Fauci say that we have the gold standard for approval and our <clears throat> approval process just takes longer. And I guess I look back at um, Great Britain approved it like a week or two ago. And right now the death rate is like 20,000 people a week. And it just seems like it could have been approved. However, the process was for Great Britain. Yeah. And they could always uh, come out and revise it and say, well, uh, you know, we want to revise it to uh, not include uh, children under 12 or something like that. But in that two week period between when Great Britain approved it and when now we'll approve it, uh, they could have been vaccinating people. So Dr. Fauci actually got into some trouble when he tried to explain what he thought of the U.K. process. And what are the things that he says, and I've got to be really careful here because it was nuanced, is that they basically will accept the findings on faith of the drug companies. Our people do it quite differently. They look over all of the data, Dr. Monto and his committee. They fly spec it. They subject it to their own peer review. Then they inform the FDA what they have found. So we have this extra layer of third-party review that Great Britain doesn't have. So I think that's I think that's one of the reasons why you saw that difference and why. And, and again, if it's about building confidence and getting people to accept it, it's finding the right balance. So could it have been shortened? Yeah, Russia had one months ago. We certainly don't want to accept Russia's way of doing things either. Uh, We'll get back uh, in just a moment, but a special guest coming up here on The Guy Gordon Show. Mitch Albom going to join us big day tomorrow with the Say Detroit Radiothon, and we will have the latest on why you're going to want to support these wonderful charities that Mitch has created. But first, let's get to Michael Stett's WJR Traffic. Thank you very much, Guy. WJR Traffic First, sponsored by the Construction Association of Michigan. Cam has been helping commercial and industrial contractors and suppliers grow since 1885. And now is the time to join. Join the most powerful network of construction professionals in the state, the Construction Association of Michigan. Join today and get listed in the 2021 Construction Buyer's Guide. Learn more at buildwithcam.com. That's buildwithcam.com. In Oakland County, road construction still has the left lane closed there at 696 eastbound between Southfield Road and Coolidge. That's uh, traffic stop and go right now from Telegraph, and that construction scheduled through 3 p.m. on Friday. And in St. Clair Shores, you're a slow go right now on 94 eastbound between 696 and 12 Mile. Now, WJR weather first from the Weather Channel. Good 10 degrees, warmer than average today, and uh, looks like some rain headed our way finally into the weekend forecast coming up. Ready for EGH guy? Yep. Okay. Detroit. We're in the mid-40s this afternoon. Good 10 degrees, warmer than average. 29 tonight. Tomorrow, partly cloudy, 42. I'm meteorologist Scott Laurie. More on News Talk 760 WJR. We're seeing some improvement in the COVID cases, but that doesn't mean in any way that we can let our guard down, especially not in the workplace where you have a responsibility for your workers and the lives of people in your hands. And that's why you don't want just anybody dealing with the disinfecting of your workplace. You want trusted professionals, the kind of professionals we know 
at EJH Construction. It is important now more than ever to protect yourself and those around you with commercial or residential COVID sanitation by EJH. Why? Well, because they aren't just a choice. They're the only choice with a decade of experience in EPA-approved, hospital-grade botanical products that are safe for humans, animals, and the environment. The people and things you care about. And the professionals at EJH are rigorously trained to make sure that your property is guaranteed maximum protection. So these are uncertain times. But here's one certainty. You can trust EJH. And that's why we've chosen them to disinfect our studios here at WJR. And you should choose them to make sure your home or business is protected too. Call EGH Construction now. Get that kind of professionalism behind you at 800-854-4534. That's 800-854-4534 or go to EJHConstruction.com. Darren McCarty here. COVID-19 is just like any tough challenge. The only way to beat it is to face it. You can't forget the day. What's that? What time are we going to be back? Uh, we're going to be back in like two and a half minutes. Okay. Uh, Mitch is on the phone, guy. Oh, that's too bad. Have you got a new picture of him to put up? So, I, I, what is he, is he? I saw some kind of facial hair the other day. Um, He's grown some COVID whiskers. He had a mustache during our meeting with Mary. This one, he is smooth faced. But um, I think I, I guess the best bet's to check it out tomorrow because I'm sure he'll be online for the radiothon, so we can uh, see it then. You know what? <laughs> If you weren't going to tune in before, you tune in for that. And you're on at 6.30 with him, right? Right. Cool, cool. I'm going to call him. Are you going down there or are you doing it virtually? No, I'm, I'm doing it right here where you see me now. Ah, just don't move. I mean, I could take my laptop to bed, I guess. And, you know, it's, it's a 30, 6.30 wake-up call guest spot. I, you know. Yeah, I don't know. That... This, is, this is my wife, Gail. This is... You're... Right. Ask her about the airplanes I used to fly over the cottage. Yeah, ask her about uh, jet shaming the Air National Guard from Wisconsin. <laughs> right. Sorry, ma'am. Could you go below Mach 1? <laughs> just, uh, you know, just don't break the sound barrier until after 3. Oh, man. Well, they, you know, it was, it was cool. They, I mean, they were low level. They were doing bombing runs, like on the deck bombing runs. Um, over Lake Michigan, and then they would come up over Charlevoix, and then that, that's where we would see them at. Uh, oh, cool! At Walloon. Yeah, I remember earlier this summer. Earlier this summer, I was really excited to watch the Blue Angels, and I was off that day. And I stood in my backyard with my dog for about a half hour, waiting for the uh, Blue Angels. I heard them, but I didn't see them. Uh-huh. And then I was seeing pictures being posted from work here with a great view of them. So I was a little salty. It's they are so cool, and those guys, they are physically superhuman. The G forces that they take and they, that they have to take without passing out. I'll tell you my quick story, Mike. Do you remember Mike Lewis? He was a reporter with Channel Four. Vaguely, yeah. So they used to take reporters when the Blue Angels come to town. They take a handful of reporters out so that they can experience a ride with them. So I got to fly with the Blue Angels, not during the show, but prior to it. And Mike Lewis said, I, I got to, there's a thing that the, you do where you flex your muscles in your body to keep the blood in your head so you don't pass out. So you don't out. pass out, right. Well, let's just say that Mike, when he did it, flexed some muscles below his waist and, yeah. Well, I'm sure he's going to love you telling that, so, <laughs> that story. So he, the, his advice to me goes, just understand, go before you go. And it, it was hysterical. It was, but I have never, I didn't do it on the plane, but I have never thrown up so violently as I did after that. And it just gave me new appreciation for how cool those guys are. Yeah, I, I almost threw up on the Raptor. All right, here we come. We'll do a call. We'll let you know when Mitch is there. Okay. Bye. This is the Guy Gordon Show on News Talk 760 WJR. And we'll be checking in with Mitch Album uh, to kind of set the stage for tomorrow's big radiothon that we always look forward to. And uh, I'm going to be bright up. Uh, you know, our, our tradition is that I'm a guest number one or two. I can't remember how it's going to fall this year, but I'm going to be on with him at 630 tomorrow morning. 
and uh, and that's what you know we, we get up with the sun. So uh, glad to kick things off. We'll be checking with Mitch in a minute. Uh, let's go to Blake and Royal Oak uh, with uh, some thoughts about the vaccine and what we heard from Dr. Monto and. Uh, Blake, if, without getting uh, putting you on the spot, are, w- will you be comfortable in accepting that vaccine once uh, y- you guys like you and I can get it? <laughs> um, I, I, I've gotten vaccines, flu shots annually, and um, I really debate the. I debate it in my head all the time. I, my wife got COVID, and I, and uh, it was a week before she tested positive, and I never got it. Wow. And I remember, well, I, I read the book that the one guy was referring to, the 1918 pandemic. A doctor performed a test on prisoners who were willing to risk getting the getting that COVID virus back then. Mm-hmm. They had them uh, in close quarters. Eventually, he was coughing into their mouths, the person that had the virus. All five of them, none of them got it. But the doctor died of that uh, from that pandemic my 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 thought is this um in february or march of this year an infant died from a birth defect uh the intestine was born outside the body it must yeah. be a horrible situation and the and the person and the infant died but then it was classified as a covid death and then there was a lot of you know argument that i think the parents said wait a minute this is not fair and then, of course, I don't know what happened later, but every time I read an article in the Detroit News, it always has a statement that says these deaths, we added 50 deaths or they were reevaluated as COVID deaths. So my question is this, and nobody ever asked it. Why can't we tell the difference if the person died from cancer or died from COVID? Because we're basing these deaths on our, our economy is being based on these deaths. We're shutting these things down. No. People are suffering everywhere. Just, just two and things I, for I, you. You know, okay, I, I, I get it, Blake, and I, I, I think it's a really good question. Here's the problem: we're not shutting down things because of death. Right now, we're shutting down things to try to flatten the curve. It's the same thing we did back in March and April. Unfortunately, Governor Whitmer's messaging is so convoluted and mixed that she says well, this is about saving lives. Well, yes, it is about saving lives. But the real effort here is to make sure that you and I have a hotel bed, not a hotel, a hospital bed to for us if you and I should suffer an emergency of some kind. As for the cancer, uh, and I've been through this in terms of how they classify and, and all of those things, the main thing that they look at is, does a person have cancer? Did they have coronary disease? Yes, they may have. Would they have died but for the COVID infection? If the answer is no, then that's a COVID death. And COVID was a contributing factor. So it is counted thusly. And it isn't, th- th- this isn't that big of a numbers game. The numbers game now is hospitalizations. So that's what we've got to look at. Um, and uh, it, it's interesting. People talk about whether or not they're going to, by the time it gets to you and I, this will be a long-term study because it's going to be March or April. So they will have four months of inoculations under their belt. You and I will probably have a better idea about what we're facing than most people. I, but if I could take it today so that I'd be protected for my granddaughter, I would be in a heartbeat. Um, is our next guest here? Laura, shake your head if uh, he's not. Not yet? All right. Let's get to Bruce in Milford. Hello, Bruce. Oh, bye. Can you hear me? I sure can. Okay. R- my comment is regarding uh, Dana Nessel and those people who say uh, you shouldn't say Merry Christmas. I wonder what those people are doing on December 25th. Um, I don't know. Hopefully they're spending time with their families. But I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm aware of Dana Nessel saying that she doesn't say Merry Christmas. Where was that? I, it, I, evidently it's nothing that crossed my radar. It's been on Channel 2 News more than once today. Well, that explains why. I've been watching Fox and watching my computer. So... Uh, what, what, she said something that she doesn't uh, tell people Merry Christmas? What did she say, Happy Holidays or something like that? Uh, apparently, you know, she, she's opposed to saying that, and uh, she's had some other other people saying, yeah, it's... it's uh, Is she that she's opposed to it, or as a Jewish American that she's just more comfortable saying something else? She's, she's opposed to people saying Merry Christmas because 
It's offensive to non-Christians. Oh, well, I guess, then I guess I'll really enjoy offending her. <laughs> so let's you and I, Good come on you. Now. Bruce, one, <laughs> let's send her our Christmas greetings right now. One, two, three. Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas Dana. Dana. There. I hope she. I hope she's good and frustrated. Uh, that's Christmas is a spirit. It's not necessarily a, when when you say that it's not a religious declaration. I'm not trying to evangelize or proselytize. I'm just wishing you well. And the Christmas spirit is is of goodwill to all people and peace. Apparently, she doesn't like peace or goodwill. <laughs> That's my only conclusion, Bruce. But you're right. The only thing you can do is smile and say, I'm still wishing you a Merry Christmas because I, it's about love, and I'm going to love my neighbor. And if that makes you uncomfortable, that's on you, not me. It's, it's, uh, it's all you can do. I know a guy that's a man of goodwill. August is in White Lake. I believe he's still there. August, you're a Merry I Christmas am, person, I, aren't you? I know you are. Ab- Yes, absolutely. In my heart, in my brain, in my soul. And you just nailed it. Be loving, be kind, have goodwill. That is the message. Why not? We are all brothers and sisters, my friend. Why can't people get that through their head? I, you know, I honestly don't know. I don't get it. Um, But we'll, you know what? All we can do is continue being Christmas people and maybe convert some people to understand that I'm not trying to convert you. I'm just wishing you well and loving on you in the holiday season. Uh, August, always good to hear from you. That'll do it for us. Uh, I, we were trying to connect with Mitch, but you will be connecting with him in a few minutes anyway here on News Talk 760 WJR. I'm sure he's going to tell you the Say Detroit Radiothon, 9th Annual, starts tomorrow uh, bright and early at 6 p.m., at 6 a.m. rather, runs till 9 p.m., and I'll be seeing you sometime around 6.30 be joining. Mitch, Kenny, Rosey, and the whole crew. Uh, thanks for being with us. Thanks so much to Oakland Community College. We so appreciate you sponsoring the show today and giving such incredible uh, learning opportunities to the people of Southeast Michigan. We'll see you Friday at 3. In the meantime, enjoy the Mitch Album Show and the Radiothon, and take care. Here's my this contest. report is sponsored by the Exergen Temporal Scanner. Fever is the leading sign of COVID-19. Use an accurate thermometer for twice daily checks. Protect your loved ones with the Exergen Temporal Scanner. It takes an accurate reading in seconds and is the only home thermometer recommended by hospitals, physicians, and clinics. Stay safe with Exergen. In St. Clair Shores, an accident on 94 westbound before 10 mile that has the left lane blocked. You're stop and go right now for 12 mile. In Oakland County, road construction has the left lane closed on 696 eastbound between Southfield Road and Coolidge. That construction scheduled at, until 3 p.m. on Friday. Now, WJR weather first from the Weather Channel. A low of 28 tonight in the Motor City. Cloudy again on Thursday with a high tomorrow of 41. Right now it's 39 degrees. I'm Michael Stetz, WJR News in two minutes. All right, Kai. All right, everyone. It was fun. All right. Take care, guys. Thanks. Uh, And by the way, Thomas, uh, whatever they said two days later was different than an approved vaccine. Trump's been talking about an approved vaccine. Get over it. Bye, Thomas. Just make people mistrust it. You're being an idiot. Merry Christmas, everyone. Take care. Bye.